That is, they fed on fecal material uh, from host animals, and uh, we find them uh, as close by as Corryville and probably closer by in, in uh, rocks of the Cincinnati, attached to crinoids up near where their anal vent would be, or they would presumably <coughs> excuse me, get uh, food from their host without damaging the host. I should have pointed out, but the plus zero interaction is called commensalism. Probably not harming the host, although that's in question now, as I'll say in just a second. <coughs> Initially, perhaps not harming the host, but simply getting food from them and uh, living, living happily on there. And I must say that that family lived on crinoids in this way for over 200 million years. It was a success story for sure, and it involved a nice interaction that we can document with the fossil record. But was it that innocuous? I don't have the picture, but our friend Tom Baumiller from the University of Michigan found, very fortunately, a snail on a Mississippian crinoid where the, the, the snail was clearly anchored permanently to that crinoid, but right underneath it was a drill hole. And that let, let the door open for understanding what's going on with some holes we see in fossil shells. This is a modern moon snail. It actually looks kind of like one of these ancient uh, platycerid snails. Uh, they have a big foot. Uh, then I don't think that they are known to be commensals in the way that we suggest the platycerids would be, but they crawl around and they drill prey like this clam. You can see that nice little chamfered hole. How do they do that? Well, they have a tongue called a radula, R-A-D-U-L-A, -A, should have spelled it out there for you, and that has teeth on it, which are uh, sort of tough uh, organic material, and they use that for rasping along with some acids that they secrete and other agents that help to break the shell down, and they drill a nice neat hole in their prey, and through that hole they extract fluids and uh, body parts from the, from the animal. So, Having a hard shell that can be closed is no longer uh, a fully um, uh, effective defense, even, even perhaps as early as the Ordovician. This is what an enlargement of the radula looks like, rather scary looking apparatus. Well, it's very interesting. Steve Felton, again, knows this very well, but there are a number of shells in our own area that show drill holes. Some of those have been contested, <laughs> uh, suggesting that some people suggesting that they may have been nothing more than just dwelling holes, and that might be an example there of some kind of worm that just bored into anything hard to, to make a, live, a hole for its life site, including dead skeletons. But other ones like these, and some that Steve has that we uh, still must uh, work on, uh, are uh, positioned in a very distinct place. There's only one in each shell, and if you start looking at them, their details are very much like those of modern moon snail borings. These are from the Devonian, but they, they show similar things. Here's uh, our pictures, scanning electron microscope pictures of holes. Here's a pair of holes where sometimes the predator gets uh, disturbed during its action and actually has to start over. But they show a lot of features that are common to modern gastropod drill holes, and we suspect that at least some of them were made by these platycerid gastropods. Now, these are pictures that are composites here. This is from modern, but these are our ancient shells, brachiopods, the local common shellfish from different ages. But what they show is if you compile all the borings from many different shells onto one outline, you see that they are not just randomly distributed, but as with modern drilling predators, they tend to go for a certain part of the animal, probably the juiciest part. They have also, what I said before, a stereotyped kind of behavior perhaps as far back as Silurian at least, and maybe Ordovician. And there are a lot of features that suggest these really <coughs> may be gastropod drill holes. Very quickly, the starfish or asteroids or sea stars, these are also known as predators in the modern. Uh, they have a very interesting mode of predation. Uh, literally, they, they have sucker-like sucker things called tube feet on their arms. They crouch around a clam, as shown here, put pressure on it from both sides until it weakens a little bit, and they got a little bit of an opening in the, between the two valves. They'll insert that stomach. They can evert their stomach, He's insert it down into the clam, and start to secrete digestive acids and literally digest the thing from the inside out. We find starfish as far back as probably Ordovician that are suggestive of the same thing. Some of them have been found. My friend Gordon Baird found one with a shellfish inside it from the middle Ordovician in Nevada and uh, some from New York uh, have been found in swarms 
this is a famous slab. It doesn't unfortunately show up quite what I want to, but uh, uh, it's some uh, these some of them are crouched on bivalves, clams. It looks like they were in a feeding swarm. So we know this was another source of predation or a potential one. There is now turning to vertebrates, and many people in the past would not have called these vertebrates, but I, I would. There's increasing evidence that the little tiny tooth-like structures, usually less than a millimeter across, that are, are, are like our teeth, made of appetite, and are very important index fossils, were vertebrates. Let's not call them fish, otherwise the, the title wouldn't be right on that book, because these kind of animals were around in the Cincinnati, and uh, they weren't quite fish, but they were very odd, interesting, little tiny animals, and from all uh, uh, we can tell of them, they did have eyes, they had these tooth-like structures. They were probably active micro-predators. My friend Jeff Over always symbolizes the size and shape of the conodont with his pinky. He said they're about the size of your pinky. He usually makes a little squeak, just so you remember. Okay, so the, uh, the conodont animals were probably eating a larvae in the water, but they may not have done a lot of damage to things. What about the early fish that would could have been here had they been here in the Cincinnati and there uh, or were around? A lot of them were not much harm to, uh, to other things because, like trilobites, they really didn't have jaw parts. Uh, they had suction mouths, and they may have fed on soft, decaying material. They may have been scavengers, or like trilobites, perhaps fed on soft worms and things. But they weren't a major threat. They were probably themselves threatened. They are covered with armor plating. You remember the picture of Pterygotus that lived in some of the same sort of marginal marine environments as these. Not out to sea, oddly enough, but in the near shore areas, some of these lived in estuaries and so on. They weren't a, a huge danger to, to other organisms. But when we get to the next chunk of time, the late, mid and late Paleozoic, we see a major ramping up says the first jawed fishes, really the first jawed fishes come in the Silurian, but uh, when we get to the Devonian period, we see a lot going on here. Here's the Devonian shown, it's a period about 417 to 459 million years ago. And here's just a diagram from Steve Stanley showing uh, many different branches of the things that we might call fish, but what you, I want to point out here with this bar, how many of those come in during this time that we call the Devonian period, named for Devon, England, but a famous set of rocks in eastern North America lie in that time period as well. And this is a diagram from an old paper of ours, of mine, that I did uh, back in 84 uh, with a colleague named Phil Signer. And uh, we simply compiled the records as they were then known of fish and arthropods uh, that looked like they could have been, as we say, durophagus, just a fancy word for hard shell crushing predators with jaws. Uh, what you see is, starting in the Devonian, there's a really a major <coughs> ramp up in the number of genera or major uh, groups of species that uh, have jaw parts. And here again, the picture, just to show that adaptive burst or what we call adaptive radiation of fishes with jaws. The jaws, by the way, probably came about from um, a modification of the old gill bars that held the gills open in the ancestors, modified with teeth on them for predation. Well, once that breakthrough took place, bing, bang, boom, you have lots of different fish from, from uh, placoderms to uh, sharks to ray fin fishes, lobe fin fishes. I'll just show you a few. <laughs> Since yesterday you heard a lot about these. Our state vertebrate fossil is Douglasteus, and that's a, uh, a very uh, formidable, large, perhaps as much as 30 foot long, armored fish that swam in uh, seas that uh, uh, lay over what is today Cleveland. Cleveland is famous for, perhaps you didn't know this, but it's most famous for fossil fish. Uh, and uh, these had not real teeth, but they had very uh, nasty, slicing, sharp edges to their jaws that could have gone after some pretty major prey, mostly up in the water column. Uh, they were armored in their heads as well. Just why they're armored is a little unclear, since they were probably the largest predators that had existed up to that time. Uh, a related group, also a placoderm, which means armored skin, were the renonids, and there are some other things called tictodonts in North America. Uh, these had a somewhat more ray-like uh, form, and they were small, uh, smaller, and some of them may have been like rays, 
feeding on the bottom dwelling animals with uh, crushing mouths. Uh, they were uh, a kind of predator that I suspect could have put some impact on shelly animals. There were sharks too of various types and some of those developed hard shell crushing teeth. Others had slicing teeth. Cleveland's also famous for its fossil sharks in, in rocks very close to the end of the Devonian period called the Cleveland Shale, which yield whole bodies of sharks uh, up to, uh, well, you can see the scale there, perhaps as much as a meter long in the biggest ones. They had spines on them too, which is rather interesting. Were they defending themselves from other predators? Quite likely, as I'll show you in a moment. By 